very much. Um, it's great to see so many people here today. To be the change, follow the kids. I don't think this message has ever been more important than it is today. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a grown-up so bad. I wanted to do grown-up things. I wanted to travel. I wanted to play baseball. I wanted to have a job. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to be a grown-up, but I would constantly hear, you have to wait until you're a grown-up to do those things. I wanted a job so bad as a kid, and I was told I had to wait until I was 12 or 13 or even 14, that my buddy Chris Herman and I started a pet detective business. We drove around on our bikes in the neighborhood, checking out the telephone poles and the signs for lost pets. We put up signs with our phone numbers on that, on those same pole, poles, and looked for the pets in the neighborhood. We did this for a couple weeks, and we would wait in his basement when we weren't out on our bikes, or we were uh, literally out looking for these pets. We never got one phone call, we never found one pet. <laughs> but I will say it's one of the fondest memories I have as a child because it felt empowering to create something. I felt like I was doing something that people told me I wasn't allowed to do until I was older. School. Schooling, I went to great schools. I had great teachers. But the school I went to, as, as many of us did at that time, was very teacher-centered. On the left, you'll see the teacher at the center with students in rows, listening and learning. It's the factory model. The factory model was the schooling that I had. And it worked, and it was nice, but it was a lot of listening. There was a set way to do something, and that was what it was. There wasn't a lot of creativity. There wasn't a lot of collaboration. Um, the student, in my opinion, was not at the center. It was the teacher and the textbook. A funny story. When I was in eighth grade, uh, we were doing math, solving problems. And probably pre-algebra, I remember solving the problem, following it down on the piece of paper, showed my work, and circled the answer. My teacher called me up at the time, and it wasn't rude, but, but scolded me for not doing it the way the book told me to, to solve for it. Now, my answer was correct, but the way I did it wasn't the way the book told me I had to do it. So I had to stand up on my desk and start to sing Frank Sinatra's My Way. Um, <laughs> because apparently I had been doing that a lot, and he had been telling me, you shouldn't do it this way, you should do it this way. And as the way the book said it, and I remember thinking to myself, but I got it right, and I showed my work. That model, right, was, there was one set way to do things. The model on the right, to me, is the classroom of today and the future. One that has very, various stations. The student is at the center of it. And in this particular picture, you don't even see the teacher. Teachers are vital to education and this process. But students must be at the center of education. The factory model is broken, and the factory model is changing to one that is more of innovation. We've got two pictures up here. And one is looking at the grain silos here in Buffalo and a, po a picture of the Innovation Center at the Buffalo Medical Center campus. Right? This city was founded in, on, on industry and manufacturing and, and transportation with the Great Lakes and the need to have workers and factories and, and doing all the necessary jobs and responsibilities and, and, a, and a great city at the time. The innovation and transformation that is happening in this city is what's, in a sense, what needs to happen in our world. We need to innovate. We need to build spaces for that innovation. And at the center of that innovation are kids, are youth. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Kids are makers and doers. I, I started working on this presentation before the events in Parkland, Florida. And as I started to work on my topic was already set, and I had some several examples, which I'm going to share in a minute. But seeing what kids are doing in Florida right now and across this nation to try and affect change is powerful. It's an amazing, uh, for me as an educator, to see what 
kind of change kids can, can make. And it's just, just fascinating and so, so powerful. So I'm, I'm so encouraged by what kids are doing right now and the, and the change that they're affecting that I had to build that into this talk. It's an incredible, an incredible time for us. Our schools need to look like this kid museum picture on the left. There's so much learning that takes place in this kind of environment. Some incredible kids and some incredible examples of kids who are makers and doers and doing amazing things. If any of you had a chance on, one of my favorite shows is Shark Tank. And you're always, I watch it all the time, I watch it with my kids. And in one episode I learned about Mikhail Almer. This is probably from a few years ago. She's 11 years old and she started a company called, uh, was it Be Sweet Lemonade? And I love seeing a child tame the sharks on the TV show. It was, it was great. She got on there. She was confident. She talked about what she was doing. And she created this brand. She created this lemonade from her, her great-grandmother's recipe that's now sold in Whole Foods stores nationwide. And it's not just about lemonade. It's also about saving the bees, who in many places are endangered right now. And her purpose is not just to have a great lemonade, but it's to do something great and to serve people. I loved listening to her. I love watching her. I've since followed her uh, career and, 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 and anytime I'm at Whole Foods, I make sure I buy her product. Business school investors. One of the great uh, pieces I get to do in my job is teach still. And I teach a class called business school and it's with fifth graders. And one of the components of this course is that they learn to become investors. They learn about money, they learn about how to spend, how to save, how to share their money. And what we do is we create a portfolio of real investments that they get to make. And in most cases, 10 and 11 year olds aren't usually investing money for a school, but ours do. And I'm thankful that my school allows us to take a small amount and allow our students to do that. And what we get to see, what we've seen is, is pretty amazing. Now, I know the market's done really well over the last, say, 18 months, two years, but our students have produced a 27% return on their investment. And what they're going to do with that money when they graduate as eighth graders, they're going to turn that investment around and make a gift to the school and decide what that money is going to go for to help make the school better. So not only they're investing and they're learning about money and how it works and the importance of saving it and growing it, but they're learning they can make a difference with it. They're learning that they can do this and give back at the same time. And it's really powerful and I can't wait to see what they do as eighth graders and how they then reinvest that back into the school. Like I said, 10 and 11 year olds aren't usually uh, doing this kind of work, but ours do and many others can as well. We've also uh, partnered with an organization called Real World Scholars, which is focused on teacher-driven uh, teacher and student-run businesses. They empower teachers and students to create businesses as part of their curriculum to deliver real learning experiences for their kids. And, and, and the majority of the profit that the students make in their businesses goes back to support their community. So it's a fascinating component and seeing that there are organizations and there are kids and programs out there supporting youth that are doing this great work because they are the ones who will affect change. So before I get to my next slide, Buffalo is a center for this work. As I talked earlier, it's a, it has a, one of the largest youth, young adult populations the transformation of this city, the renaissance that Buffalo is going through is in large part due to the innovation and the entrepreneurial mindset that's developed here and continues to develop. And youth are at the center of that movement. So what do the adults need to do to help the kids be the change? Talk less and listen more. We're good at talking. I know I'm really good at talking. My kids will tell you I talk to them way too much. Talk less, listen more. My wife had a great t-shirt that she talked about wearing as a kid that said, kids are people too. And she wore it proudly around her house, right? I might add to that shirt today and say, kids are powerful people too. 
look at the change they're affecting. Look at the change they're making in our country right now. We need to listen more. We need to talk less and to follow their lead. We also need to help kids find a purpose. Purpose is so important, right? If you ever get a chance, and some of you have probably seen it, Simon Sinek's uh, TED Talk on knowing your why. Your why is important. You ha we have to help our kids develop and understand purpose and why they are doing what they are doing. That passion, that drive, that's what's not only going to get you up in the morning, but that's what's going to get you to stay up at night to work on a project, to solve a problem, to create something. That knowing your why is so important. And as adults, we must position our kids. We must help them explore those whys and develop that passion because they are going to be the drivers for us in the future. Last but not least, it's failing forward. I love this term. And in my class, I had I was fortunate I had an entrepreneur come in to talk to, to the kids about lessons learned and messages shared. Failing forward, I think, is one of the best phrases I've ever heard about learning from mistakes. We have to help our kids grow. Failure, most people don't wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to fail at this, right? <laughs> but it's going to happen. And we are going to fail. We're going to fumble. We're going to have foibles. Picking ourselves up, developing resilience, learning from those mistakes, learning from mistakes of others is vital as we help our kids grow and not being afraid of it. Failure can paralyze us, but it can, it, it, what it must do is enlighten us, enlighten us to grow and change. And our kids are resilient. Our kids can brush their knees off. And our kids are going to be the ones that are going to learn from these mistakes, ours and theirs. And we must help them do that. It's so important. So adults, get out of the way. Kids will be the ones that make the change. In closing, as a kid, I wanted to be a grown-up so bad. To do all the cool things grown-ups did. As an adult, that paradigm has shifted. As an adult, I want to be a kid. Because they do the coolest things. While we can't re-engineer uh, aging to make that happen yet, oh, I don't think I want that to happen, right? We can and must listen more to and follow our kids. They have incredible powers and energy and ideas that need to be heard. They will be the ones that affect change in the future, and it's time to listen and follow. Thank you.